I would like to welcome everyone. Uh, thank you all for tuning in for our today live webinar with Dr. Richard Timberlake, one of the leading experts on the U.S. monetary policy and probably one of the greatest historians of the dollar since his professor Milton Friedman. Now, during the next 30 minutes, we're going to be discussing Dr. Timberlake's upcoming book, Constitutional Money, and a review of the Supreme Court's monetary decision. So, just to give you a heads up, I'm going to provide you with, with a picture of how actually the book, uh, the book, the cover looks like, so that you can afterwards go to the stores and get the book. So, Dr. Uh, Timberlake, thank you for joining us. Let me just put you on the whiteboard. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be able to do this. It's a, an interesting uh, uh, innovation from what I've been used to. Um, <clears throat> do you want me to discuss the book now? Yes. Let's first of all uh, give the whiteboard entirely to you so that you can discuss and provide everyone with the, the concept of the book. Okay. Now, uh, how many, how many ins institutions in the United States are the listeners familiar with? Uh, there are three that I have to discuss. The Supreme Court, uh, the Federal Reserve System, and the Gold Standard. And uh, I think everybody might, is probably, uh, understands most of uh, most of the what those institutions uh, stand for um, but my book um, do, uh, singles out the monetary decisions that the Supreme Court has made over the last 200 years they began, those decisions began in 1819 with one uh, decision that was labeled McCulloch versus Maryland and ended in 1935 with a decision on the so-called gold clause cases, uh, which dealt with the question of whether uh, gold could be uh, prohibited by the U United States government, the ownership of gold. Um, and in between, uh, there were about nine, eight or nine other decisions that were very important. And my, what my book does is take each decision as it came, that is, historically, and then uh, fits that decision into the context of the monetary events of the time that the decision was made. So the book itself is then uh, not only a discussion of the cases that the Supreme Court adjudicated, but also a summary history of monetary affairs that occurred at that time. Um, now, is that clear? Or should I say anything more? I think as a concept that could be clear, but if I may, could you could I ask you a question? Certainly. Okay, now you do discuss nine uh, nine sub court decisions, but is there any court decision in particular that had a significant impact on what monetary policy we have today, or would you say that all of them actually have equal value? No, they did not have equal value. There was one especially, uh, the court decisions, two or three, I should say, in the, in the uh, 
the, the latter part of the 19th century, the so-called Greenback uh, decisions uh, or cases that were much more important, those decisions followed the uh, unfortunate experience of the American Civil War, which was a, a war about states' rights versus federal government rights. It was also a war about slavery, but the primary uh, the, the primary uh, conflict was about the, the sovereignty of states versus the sovereignty of the federal government. Now, during, I don't want to discuss that any further, because, but uh, the result was that, uh, that the two, there were two governments in the United States and they were at war with each other. And the Northern government uh, uh, issued greenbacks, that is full, legal tender, paper money, uh, legal tender for all debts due to and from the government and due to and from private individuals. Now that was the big change. That was the big step, uh, you might say backward, <clears throat> that uh, these notes were full legal tender, not just for government payment, but for transactions or debts that were incurred between private parties. Now, um, uh, so when the, when the cases came before the Supreme Court in 1869, um, the Supreme Court at that time ruled that the, the greenbacks were not legal tender, not allowed as legal tender for debts incurred before passage of the act. That is, if two parties made a contract before the legal, before the legal tender acts were passed by Congress, that the, the debtor had to pay in whatever the contract stipulated. And that usually meant uh, uh, precious metal. But the, so the first decision on the, le on the greenbacks said they were not legal tender <clears throat> for debts incurred before the passage of the act. However, the cases came up, were brought up again by the, uh, the uh, intervention of the Attorney General of the United States. So the court uh, uh, had, to, had to make decisions on two more cases, uh, which you did in 1870. And the, by this time, the the composition of the court had changed. Uh, instead of being eight members, it was nine, and President Grant had appointed two new members. One old member had retired, and there was a vacancy on the court. So now the court had nine members. The two new members favored legal tenderization, if I may use that term, of the greenbacks, and consequently voted five to four to make the greenbacks legal tender for all debts, public and private, both before and after the passage of the acts. And that was the big, that was the biggest decision the Supreme Court ever made about money, because that opened the door to full legal tender paper money. Uh, well, after that, 
uh, there was a, 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 there was a great deal of monetary affairs and history that goes on at this time. Uh, the gold standard was uh, not working at that time. We were on a, the greenback standard, but gradually uh, uh, prices were reduced enough so that gold became again the standard and Congress reaffirmed that uh, on uh, January 1st, 1879. So uh, we were back on a gold standard at that time. But that still left the greenbacks uh, as a currency that was legitimate, uh, legitimate because of the Supreme Court decision. Um, <clears throat> So the gold standard was functioning as it should, but the federal government uh, had issued uh, several hundred million dollars of greenbacks that were still out there in the economy, exchanging and being used as back reserves and all the rest. So there were two monies actually uh, uh, circulating side by side, but the gold standard was the, the method of uh, adjustment. There, were no, there was no central bank, in other words. Uh, well, that, that system worked tolerably well. Um, uh, even though there were greenbacks, uh, they were not, there were not enough of them to uh, make the gold uh, standard unworkable. And that situation continued up until the beginning of World War I. Uh, a good friend of mine says that we should repeal World War I, and uh, I agree with it. Um, but uh, at the beginning of World War I, the United States was not engaged in the war, but <coughs> the, uh, the Congress, in it, without reference to the war, passed the Federal Reserve Act and created the Federal Reserve System. Now that, the creation of the Federal Reserve System had nothing to do with the greenbacks or with their acceptance or anything else. Uh, the, the Federal Reserve Act was passed as a sort of a, uh, uh, an, a uh, an agency that would help the banks when they were in a liquidity crisis, that is, from time to time. And it took over the function of the, the bank's um, clearinghouse associations, which had functioned in that uh, capacity for about 50 years. So we now have a Federal Reserve System that's going to, uh, to uh, come, become operational whenever there's a banking crisis by granting greater credit and providing uh, more reserves to the banking system, all very necessary in light of the fact that the Clearinghouse Association was already doing that very effectively. Now, I don't understand, I studied this a bit, but I don't understand why, how, the government officials could uh, could cancel out the clearinghouse arrangement and bring in the uh, central the, the Federal Reserve System, which at that time was not a central bank, uh, but simply a lender of last resort, as it was called. All right. 
now we get into World War One, and the, the whole world is ready to go up in flames, but uh, it manages to end itself. And uh, uh, then there was the Treaty of Versailles and all of the various difficult uh, monetary adjustments that were made after that, including the hyperinflation in Germany and other Central European countries like Hungary and Austria and I don't know about Latvia. I don't think uh, uh, there may not have been a, a hyperinflation in Latvia, um, but there were there, these hyper inflations were very debating and, and very d difficult. Uh, they were primarily a result of, of the reparations that the Allied powers forced on, on the uh, Central European powers after World War I, part of the uh, Versailles Treaty. And I'm, I'm, I'm certainly uh, going over this very quickly. Uh, so uh, you may have questions, but um, in the United States, uh, we had a, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York was, uh, uh, was the primary institution for, for, for um, handling monetary policy. And it maintained a stable price level uh, uh, through the 1920s and up to 1929. Then uh, other um, elements uh, became prominent in the Federal Reserve System and were able to uh, upset the apple cart and and generate a a significant hyper depression in the United States. So we had in the 1920s, 1922-23, hyperinflation of the Germanic countries. Uh, and in the early 1930s, that is 1929, 30, 31, we had a hyper depression in the United States, which spread out to a lot of other countries in the world through the uh, international payment system. And nobody knew in the United States seemed to understand that the Federal Reserve is the, is the institution that was do, causing all the trouble because it, it made, a public pay, made public statements that it was doing everything it could to protect the gold standard and uh, provide uh, credit, but in fact, it was not doing that. And so we had a terrible depression, and, uh, and the gold standard came to bear the brunt of the responsibility for the, gold, for the depression because nobody understood what the Federal Reserve was doing. Uh, the uh, uh, the gold standard was was not functioning as a gold standard, but was being managed uh, by the Federal Reserve System. Effectively, it was being uh, prevented from doing what it would do if left alone. And um, but uh, most of the uh, problems were a result of Federal Reserve policy. Nonetheless, gold standard came to, to uh, uh, be the scapegoat for the Depression. <clears throat> and the Roosevelt administration at the time and Congress, uh, oh, we've gone out, of, I, don't, I have a blank screen. Are you there? Yes, yes, we're there. We're here. Okay, well, I have a black, I can't see you, but uh, shall I go on? 
Yes, so I yes, can please, hear you? Yes, please. I think if everyone okay. else can see you, that's the most important part. And as long as you can hear us, that's also that's also important. I think you maybe just to move the mouse. Then you should be able to uh, see it. The mouse. Yeah, I think you can just move the mouse a little bit because I think your computer uh, oh. began losing. Oh, thank goodness! <laughs> it went completely black. Uh, so you you have to control that, Gita. <laughs> um, well, uh, the the last uh, legal tender case. I mean, the last um, monetary uh, decision was made on the legal tender question of whether um, Congress could. Um, uh, set aside the gold standard and and the Supreme Court agreed that it could and um, there was a lot more to the decisions themselves but that was the ultimate effect and right at the the uh, uh, the gold clause cases allow the government to uh, call in all the gold pay for it with paper money at then prevailing price and then melt it all down into ingots and store it in Fort Knox. And uh, by 1940, the U.S. government, had the Treasury and the Federal Reserve, had 20,000 tons of gold bullion, uh, gold is stacked in uh, in bars in in the in uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky, and a few other places. Uh, so the gold was effectively demonetized, as far as domestic people were concerned. Uh, domestic holders of gold, people in the United States. Who didn't want to turn in their gold uh, often uh, just kept it and didn't say anything, but they also were allowed to keep a hundred dollars worth that's about five ounces uh, or and they were also allowed to keep coins that had numismatic value that is coinage value. Uh, so all of the gold didn't get into the hands of the government, but a great deal of it did. And that was melted down so that it would never be used as money again, even though we were on the gold standard. Now there's a there's a conundrum for you. Uh, how can you have a uh, a gold and silver standard if all the gold and Never mind the silver. All the gold melted down into bars that you can't use. <laughs> so, uh, well, that left a sort of a vacuum in monetary policy. That is, if there's no gold standard. What is there? Well, uh, Congress uh, then passed the the Federal Reserve Banking Act. It was called just the Banking Act of 1935, and effectively that said that uh, the Federal Reserve was now in control of the monetary system, um, and and that's the way it's been ever since. Although uh, at the same time, gold was prohibited for payment um, by the law of uh, the laws that were passed in 1934. Gold was no longer allowed to be used or held as uh, an item of, uh, of uh, business, uh, as a commodity, um, except of course for coin collectors and a few 
things like that. Uh, it could still be used to uh, for wedding rings and to plate uh, as plate for dishes and things like that. Uh, well, th that situation uh, continued up until the 1970s when another act uh, was passed that, that rescinded some of the other gold, uh, gold acts and said that people could once again hold and use gold, but not as a money. And that's for about where we are today. So the gold cause cases were effectively the last uh, Supreme Court cases that came into the uh, into the picture, and but my my account goes up through the the nineteenth nineteen seventies and up to the present. Uh, uh, we now are allowed to use gold uh, for some things, but not for uh, not not for money. If you start a a monetary a monetary uh, business using gold, you say a banking system with gold, uh, you'll get raided by the uh, uh, the social the, the Secret Service or the Federal, Federal Bureau of Investigation. So, uh, uh, in terms of, of monetary freedom, uh, this country is, is very much remiss. It's still not back to what it was prior to 1913. And, uh, and my book is simply a, a discussion and an explanation of how these Supreme Court decisions tied in with monetary policy uh, to, to bring us where we are now. <clears throat> and uh, uh, many of us in the United States, economists, I should say, uh, would like to get back to a monetary system that is, I used the word very carefully and deliberately, constrained. That's what the Constitution meant. It, it constrained the monetary system to gold and, and or silver. And by doing so, it put a a cap or a lid or a ceiling on the amount of money that banks could create. <clears throat> so there was a control that was based on market forces that, uh, that provided a very stable um, monetary system <clears throat> and uh, one that could not be um, readily inflated or deflated. <clears throat> uh, prior to the uh, Greenback cases uh, in the early 1870s, that is from the time the Constitution was ratified in 1789 to 1870, which is about almost 90 years, uh, no one ever thought that anything but gold and silver would, would be the basis for a monetary system. The idea of, of unrestrained paper money was completely alien to everybody in the United States. Uh, <clears throat> but the political pressures that resulted from the Civil War uh, changed that, and uh, and I can't go into all the details, but I have them in the book. So uh, uh, <clears throat> if one wants to, one can can find it out. 
I think we actually can address one of the questions that we have in the chat, if you don't mind. Uh, now, one of our guests would like to know how much of your work comes from Edwin Vieira's Jr. Uh, pieces of eight, the monetary powers and disabilities of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, I didn't get all of that. Uh, are you questioning my uh, whether I use the word junior in my name? No, no, um, no, no, no. Uh, the guest would like to know uh, how much of your work maybe comes from uh, a book by Edwin Vieira, Pieces of Eight, The Monetary Powers and Disabilities of the U.S. Constitution. So, did you take maybe some ideas? Is your book uh, based on some of the ideas uh, that could be found in, in that book? Um, I'm not sure what the question is asking. Uh, I wrote a book called Monetary Policy in the United States. Uh, he's not referring to that, is he? I guess then the guest would have to specify. But uh, let me just maybe ask you another question. While the guest tries to specify his his question, I have uh, one of my own. Uh, in your book, you suggest for a um, constrained monetary system, including the possibility of reinstitution of authentic gold standards. Now, how difficult would this actually be, and how difficult it would be to implement uh, this idea? To restore the gold standard? Is it, I think that's, that's what you're asking. Yes, yes, yes. How, that's, that's my how question. Restore the gold standard? Well, politically, yeah, what, it's very hard, difficult. Go ahead. Yes, yes, yes. So what would be the main obstacles as this is one of the ideas expressed in your book. Therefore, yeah. uh, if we try to apply it to the real world, what would be the main obstacles for the implementation and execution of this idea? <laughs> several obstacles. Uh, most of the political establishment wouldn't like it because it would take away from them the power of the central bank to uh, provide funding for the, the massive amounts of government debt that have been occurring. And that's true throughout the world, not just in the United States. Every in every country, uh, 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 status and government officials have learned that the, that the central bank is a fountain of money to, to provide uh, for their fiscal needs. Of course, they're running into problems with that in uh, many countries like Cyprus and Greece and so on. But uh, besides that, the, the practical matter is that people have to have gold and be familiar with it and see it. And all, all of this gold is now in, in Fort Knox in, in cars. So uh, uh, it's not, uh, my own solution to this is for the federal government to give this money back to the people in the country so that there'd be widespread ownership of gold and people would start putting the gold into banks and creating bank accounts based on gold and gold redeemability, paper redeemability into gold. Um, but you're right to suggest that it's a difficult matter uh, 
the other uh, ways to handle it uh, uh, without putting all the gold back into the hands of the people, uh, I, I would do that by tax uh, returns, uh, rebates. But uh, uh, my, my friend Lawrence White has a, Okay, yes, it seems that we've got disconnected with Dr. Kapunye anywhere. Uh, we are once again joined by Dr. Richard Timberlake. You just experienced a small technical issue, but we still have 10 minutes until we have to wrap up the webinar. So, uh, Dr. Richard Timberlake, thank you once again for rejoining us on the webinar. I'm very pleased to be here. Okay, so we were talking about, before we got disconnected, we were talking about uh, about the obstacles, the main challenges uh, that we would have to be confronted if we talk about the execution uh, for a constrained monetary system, including the possibility of the reinstitution of authentic gold standard. That's correct. Uh, the best, the, uh, there are various technical means to, to bring it back, and I think the best way would be through the back door, that is allow banks to start gold accounts and then just let the uh, people who have accounts with the banks uh, use gold or, or use the old system and uh, if they use gold the banks would of course be committed to gold just for uh, for those accounts now if that were to begin, if banks were to start gold accounts in addition to all the paper that they already uh, deal with, the, um, uh, the gold would gradually uh, absorb uh, the paper and uh, in time, in years, a couple of years or five, uh, we might be back to a gold standard. But most important of all, the government itself must uh, accede and, and agree to the, this kind of change and, and must promote it by every means it can. And that means it must get rid of the central bank, which is called in this country the Federal Reserve System. Uh, and and uh, make the make the central bank simply a vestige, uh, a a non policy making uh, variant of what it used to be. Uh, allow it to exist, but don't give it any power. And. I'm, I'm afraid that there's no government that's ready to do to follow this this uh, pattern, this uh, prescription. But somehow or other, we've got to get rid of uh, of um, discretion in the conduct of monetary policy, not only in this country but in the whole world, or. The world's going up in a blaze of paper. <laughs> so that's, that's about all I can say. It's very difficult to undo the harm that's been done over the, over the centuries. Uh, we started out with a constrained monetary system with a constitution, and everybody knew it. It was nobody questioned it. Now we're we're in uh, in Never Neverland with this uh, uh, 
with central banking all over the world. And it's very difficult to undo that particular kind of harm. <clears throat> okay, and uh, my last question, and I think we will be able to address before we finish the webinar in five minutes, if we maybe try to go beyond uh, the U.S. Uh, monetary policy and beyond the suggest for the U.S. to reestablish the authentic gold standard, what about other currencies? Uh, I mean, what about other countries? Since actually no other economy utilizes gold standard as the foundation for their monetary system. Could this also be somehow applicable to other countries as well, not just the U.S.? It certainly should uh, and could and I hope would. <laughs> um, it was rather interesting back about 1998 when the European, I don't have this exact time, but when the European Union was forming and the European Central Bank, they wondered what, how, what would be the best policy? And, uh, there was a, uh, a Frenchman named Gustave Destang, uh, something or other, and uh, he was the primary mo uh, motivator uh, for the for the new uh, central bank standard, and he never once mentioned the gold standard. But the gold standard would have been perfect to be installed uh, for installation uh, with the uh, with the European Central Bank. It, he had a perfect opportunity and didn't take it and didn't consider it. Uh, but now uh, there are different other ways to handle it. One way is to uh, for any country in the European Union to uh, declare it's, that it's got a, a limited monetary uh, policy, that the central bank can only move within limits, and the limits are primarily uh, to maintain a stable price level. Uh, if a central bank did nothing, nothing at all except uh, control its quantity of money so as to provide a stable price level, it would, uh, it would at least be a C-plus system. It, it's not perfect, but it would not, it would, it would take away the discretion uh, from the central bank's uh, um, uh, control and, and provide a, a predictable constraint to central bank policy. So the short answer for every country is to tie its, tie its price level to the quantity of money that's being generated by the central bank and make that a rigorous and un, unyielding and uh, principle for policy. <clears throat> that way, at least we would prevent the kind of, of uh, shenanigans that are going on today. Do you agree with me, Gita? <laughs> Absolutely. I could not disagree with you. And I think the last, last question that we could address is from one of our viewers. So, five minutes to left. Uh, we have last question. Can we have a gold standard and a fractional reserve banking system? Yes, a fractional reserve banking system is, uh, is not a uh, hindrance to a gold standard. Uh, <clears throat> it's a separate problem and it should 
and it's worth addressing. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering, are you asking me about the fractional reserve commercial banking system? If so, I uh, I'll ask. What? I think what the guest would like to know is whether it would be possible in reality to have uh, uh, to have a gold standard and the fractional reserve banking system. Whether we could have the two in real life in the uh... well, I would say that we surely can. We had it in the United States, uh, and I think in many other countries, certainly in England and France, prior to uh, World War One. Uh, from uh, in the in the last third, well, the last third of the 19th century up to World War One, uh, we had fractional reserve bank banking along with the gold standard and they all work fine. Uh, uh, there were several accounts of how, uh, how readily uh, available uh, adjustments were at that time. Uh, John Maynard Hings wrote a, a, a uh, an article or a book uh, that that discussed this subject, but there's nothing inherent about a fractional reserve banking system that makes it uh, un unworkable under a gold standard. The gold is uh, the reserve that the banks have, and the banks uh, uh, certainly have to have constraints, uh, legal constraints about uh, their uh, their creation of of uh, bank deposits, but uh, I don't see any uh, uh, fundamental problem that would uh, prevent a gold standard just because there's a fractional reserve banking system. As long as the Dr. banks Rick use gold as reserves, what's what's the problem? Dr. Richard Timberlake, thank you so much for joining us. Fortunately, we have to wrap up our today's webinar since it's coming to an end, but I would like to sincerely thank you for finding the time and joining us today in order to discuss your upcoming book, Constitutional Money. And to everyone else, I hope that you have learned something new about the U.S. monetary policy. And in case you wish to expand your knowledge even further, then I suggest that you purchase Dr. Richard Timberlake's book, Constitutional Money, a review of the Supreme Court's monetary decisions that will soon be available on the Internet as well as in stores. So thank you so much once again. It was a pleasure having you, Dr. Timberlake. Well, thank you very much, Keith, and you've been a wonderful uh, help to me to, uh, to make this possible. I hope the people uh, who've been listening uh, stand me. Um, my book uh, is available as of the end of March uh, from the uh, um, uh, from the Cambridge University Press and uh, it's uh, it's not cheap by the way <laughs> you, you may suffer what we ticker shock in the United States when we look at a price and and it's uh, a little more than we expected but uh, that's the nature of publications this day and age. And uh, I hope everybody has a chance to read it sometime. Uh, well, thank you very much, Gita. You've been a wonderful hostess and, uh, and, and... It was my pleasure. It was my pleasure. And once again, thank you. And I think if there's a book that is worthwhile spending a good amount and it's definitely your book so thank you
Well, you're welcome. I guess we're over, aren't we? Sorry? So I, shall I just close my window? Yes, yes. So to, to click, you just press on the 